start the recording process. So this is our uh, empathy uh, experts, activists, uh, empathy circle. And what we're, this is a panel of uh, people who have been working extensively on the topic of empathy, who have written books about it or, or making films about it or doing empathy tent work. So maybe we can just go around and introduce ourselves. I'm Edwin Rutsch, director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. And for 11, 12 years, I've been working pretty extensively on the topic of uh, empathy and how do we build a more empathic society, interviewed hundreds of empathy experts. And I'm now bringing uh, these experts together to hold dialogues on different topics. And this one's going to be on on the definition of empathy. So maybe we could go around. Oh, and share, you can just do a, little, a short introduction, just how people can contact you. If you have a book, feel free to wave it in front of the camera. <laughs> uh, my website is cultureofempathy.com, and I see Minter rushing to get his book. <laughs> so do you want to uh, start, uh, Indy? Yeah, sure. My books are in boxes right now. So um, <laughs> I have... Uh, I got my degree in computer science and was a software engineer for a long time, got into the front end design. And um, when I got into the front end design, we were also starting to make software for people who were not scientists, where there was a process that we were just embodying in the software. Um, so that meant I had to learn how to understand people. And so I spent my career um, like 25 years building that. I've written two books. Um, one is called Mental Models uh, for Understanding Human Behavior uh, for product design, software digital specifically. And the other one's called Practical Empathy, uh, which is kind of more a book meant for other developers to look at. Um, and I started a company, founded a company with a couple of other people called Adaptive Path that um, eventually got bought by a large bank uh, as an acquire sort of thing. Uh, but the, um, the, the, the good things that Adaptive Path did was sort of pull the user experience field together and offer a lot of materials and learning uh, for free and also pulled the groups together in terms of conferences and sort of was a pioneer in that area. Okay, and uh, how did people get in contact with you? Um, I've got a website, www.indyyoung.com. Okay, and you've also done talks on empathy, given yeah. and do trainings, and yeah, so you've been working intensely on the topic. Yeah. Really, my uh, talks and trainings are about understanding people, the problem space, before you go making up solutions, um, and listening, empathy, um, perspective building. That's all a part of it, and I've got a a way that I teach people how to do that, but I want to understand, uh, I want to understand how the psychology field defines these various aspects so that I can describe it better. Okay, uh, Lou, would you like to go? So I'm Lou Zwire. I'm a filmmaker and an educator. Uh, I have a degree in film from UCLA and um, have had a worked in television news for a while, uh, taught media production at the high school and college levels. I'm currently working on a documentary about nonviolence. Um, I've been uh, involved in uh, Edwin's Empathy Tent work for over a year, I think. Um, uh, been a teacher of nonviolent communication for like since 1995, so for many, many, many years and made media projects about that practice. Uh, and I've been doing empathy. At my latest project where I live to try to build community is a thing called Petaluma Conversations. I live in Petaluma, California, where we bring people together for evenings of conversation, small circles, empathy circles, where they do conversations about community topics. I think, you know, empathy has been a powerful tool in all the things I've done, whether that's education, understanding students, um, academic technology. I worked for the California State University system, running a teaching and learning, uh, teaching and technology center for the whole system for like 17 years, I was director of that. So working with faculty to understand their needs, 
in how to integrate technology, um, user-centered design in terms of understanding the user's needs and developing technology, uh, and then in conflict resolution and problem solving, which is you know, something I've done a lot of. And then also actually the other thing I've done is leadership training. So I've been involved in personal growth since my 20s and I'm part of a group in Sacramento called the Authentic Leadership Center where we do transformational leadership training. And empathy is a, we teach a communication model as part of that. And empathy, which is like trying to, wanting to understand the other person, really listening to what's going on in them and being able to reflect that back to them, that's a key skill. So there are lots of different ways that I've used it. Um, and I'm really excited about uh, being in a discussion about it. And how can people contact you? Uh, my email is uh, lou.zwire at gmail.com. And you can see how my name's spelled. It's on the screen there. So um, you can contact me by email. Okay. It won't show up on this. It doesn't show up in the recording. Oh, it doesn't? Okay. But it'll be, if you look in the chat window, in the description below, all the links will be there. And the spelling uh, name's there, right? Yeah. Uh, Minter, you want to? And you're muted. Trying to show good process. <laughs> um, so, Indy, I um, was talking about with a coder professor at the University of Texas about how to have empathic coding. That's a topic for later. Uh, and okay. Lou, um, I am a filmmaker, but I like to say I'm actually a film maker as opposed to a films maker because I've only done one film it just so happens that the documentary I have done is about a, uh, a ring that looks just like this That's that. an Annapolis 1932 original ring um, my grandfather had one of those um, and so the story is about a ring called the last ring home and since you all are in California mostly mm -hmm. I thought I'd let you know that this weekend is Memorial Day weekend and in Sacramento on KVIE and in San Francisco on KQEH, KQED uh, and that's it um, and probably on a few other stations, um, my film will be showing. It's on uh, nationally all over this weekend. The Last Ring Home. So Lou, you know what that means. It's not so easy to get documentaries out there, but... Nine hundred and seventeen airings this weekend. Um, so that's part of what I do. I, meanwhile, I've written two other books. The Last Ring Home being about the film, but I've also written this book called Artificial Empathy. And the purpose of that book, amongst other things, is to to say that business can be a way to change society. And in that, most people or a lot of people work the environments at work have an impact on the way you are at home and in society. And why not then trying to turn that into a force for good? So injecting empathy into the workplace is good for society. It turns out it's also good for the bottom line and, and, and making better design, as you said, Lou, and, and so on. And then finally, I looked at the second half of the book is all about encoding empathy into AI. And in order to encode it into artificial intelligence, you kind of need to get a good grip on it and, 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 and also try to figure out what you're trying to do with whatever AI you are implementing. And in that process, not only will you perhaps learn more what is, a, what is empathy, you, you might have a, a mirror that looks back at you and says, why? Voilà, that's my... Style of introduction, I'm based in London, live in Paris, changed countries 15 times, changed homes 34 times. like to say I speak lots of languages um, and change is for sure. And how do people get in contact with you? Well, um, good good um, personal branding by Indy and Lou. Um, mine is minterdial.com. That's my general place where I blog. I've been doing a podcast for 10 years on Minter Dialogue. And I tweet at M D I A L. Okay, thanks. So uh, what we're doing here is an empathy circle on the definition. We want to define empathy within the context of the circle. So a lot of times uh, the definition of empathy is sort of abstract. It's out there. And we want to talk about how do we see the definition of empathy, but actually point to it uh, within the circle here. Like try to make it as tangible 
is is possible uh, and without it being sort of actually like where do you see it within within the circle and we're going to be using the empathy circle uh, practice which is a structured dialogue process based on mutual active listening I think everyone's familiar with with the process uh, in this process, one person will speak, they will select the person they're going to speak to, and that person will uh, re reflect or recap their understanding of what the person has said to their satisfaction. Uh, we're going to start with uh, five minute turns. Uh, would you be willing to take time, Lou? Do you? Sure. Would you? Uh, and, um, and so in this process, uh, you speak, and you don't want to say too much, but you, you want to pause often to give the listener a chance to reflect back their understanding. As the listener, if it's becoming too much and too complicated for you to, to sort of hold and feel like you can reflect back, and say, ah, just hold on a second, let me reflect back or recap what I'm hearing. And the recap is, you know, in your own words, sort of summarizing or paraphrasing or, you know, like I said, recapping what was said. And uh, yeah, that's sort of the basic process. Um, you can go to empathycircle.com for anyone that wants to see the instructions in greater detail, but everyone here is already uh, familiar with it. So in terms of, uh, yeah, I guess we can get started. Just doing is a good way to start. And uh, so, so I just want to say before you do that, so I'm keeping time, and this is the sound you'll hear when the time's up. Okay, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sound. <laughs> Let's try that again. That was very modest. <laughs> Bless you, by the way, Indy. The uh, pen dropped. <laughs> I've also got the That's time good. here. I can. Okay. okay. Well, hopefully, hopefully it's a, it's a chimes. So okay. Okay, you'll hear some chimes. Okay. And if you don't see that, I'll give you some kind of. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 So again, it's, uh, it's empathy. We're defining empathy within the uh, context of this circle, like, you know, point to it. Uh, I just give a quick introduction that uh, Dan Batson had written a piece that I'd sent everyone a link to. And he started with the description of two women talking to each other. And then his definition was pointing two different aspects of that conversation. So that's sort of what we want to do here. You know, it's not, you're not we're not going to punish you if you don't do it that way, but, but that's kind of the intention. Uh, so whoever would like to begin, select who you'd like to speak to, and uh, let's see where this goes. No. <laughs> Looks like you're up, Indy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm like, how do I ask the question? So I'll ask, uh, since I know Lou, I will ask you, how do you, okay. how do you define various kinds of empathy? And then the next time around, I'll ask, how do you define compassion differently than that? So, so I'm going to speak first is what you're saying. And, and the question you want me to speak to is, how do I define empathy? Yeah. Okay. All right, and I'll speak to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me start the clock here. <laughs> All right, so how do I define empathy? Uh, so I think of empathy as um, connecting with the feelings and the desires of the person that I'm listening to and that they're expressing, whether those are expressed explicitly or kind of implicitly in what they are saying. And by connecting with them, I mean feeling them, kind of reaching out with my feelings, <laughs> with my heart, I guess, and feeling those things and, and actually letting them affect me too. So it means letting the way they're feeling and what they're saying come into me and let it stimulate me. So. I let my feelings show about what I'm hearing, usually. Uh, although actually not, I, I, I would also say that I uh, temper that based on um, how, how strongly they're expressing it. So I try to mirror what, where they are in terms of the level of um, uh, exp my own Uh, showing what I'm feeling or thinking. Mm -hmm. 
You might want to yeah, and then, to reflect there. Was... Yeah, and then so feeling those things, and then you know you can have silent empathy, which is you don't have to actually say it back to them. You could just be responding to them non-verbally, but they would be seeing something or reflecting it back with words, and that would be, you know, okay. that would be with words. So I'll stop there. Okay. So, uh, and earlier in the conversation, you said wanting to understand the other person. Um, so wanting to understand the other person, connecting with the feelings and desires of the person you're talking to. So it's real time um, in the moment and mirroring uh, kind of what they're feeling, like at the level that they're feeling so that they uh, maybe are using that as the way you connect. Yeah, I would say the, the mirroring has to do with showing them that I am feeling with them, mm -hmm. that I'm being impacted by what they're saying. I think that's part of empathy is um, showing that you are with them, mm -hmm. not necessarily agreeing with them, <laughs> but that you are feeling with them. Okay, uh, right, yeah. Um, so is this the only, I'm, am I allowed to ask another question? No, I just have to reflect back until he feels heard. Then when it's your turn, you can ask anyone anything. Okay. So yeah, you were, you were sort of, I asked about connecting and you're all like, yes, I'm showing them that even though I may not agree with them, I'm feeling with them. Yes. Yeah. And I would, and, 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 and so I would say it's not the job of empathy. I don't think of empathy as agreeing or disagreeing with the person. So that's something I explicitly withhold, I would say. Uh, although I, I guess, you know, in, in my actual practice of it, if I'm, if I'm agreeing with the person a lot, I tend to let that show in my face. If I'm mm -hmm. disagreeing, I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's important when doing empathy not to agree too strongly or too explicitly with the person, because I think that is, that then it becomes you doing expression, really, you're kind of saying your own piece, as opposed to Mm. just that you're resonating with them you know mm -hmm. okay yeah so it's important not to take over the conversation in a way even if it's just with your your uh, emotional agreement with them yeah okay and you're talking about face also so this is facial expression this is actually connected in the moment also in the locations co-located yeah i mean empathy can be uh, for me empathy can be communicated completely non-verbally so just mm -hmm. by body language facial expression mm -hmm. yeah. you know, gestures okay uh, okay so yeah you mentioned silent reflection or verbal reflection yeah. um, and i just want to make sure i understand that you're talking about being in a space with that person yes okay and i would even say it could be empathy can be communicated by what might be called empathic action which would be hugging the person or putting you know putting your uh, touching their leg or their shoulder or you know making contact uh -huh. <laughs> All that. that's um have to be careful about that yeah right <laughs> violating people's um space but uh yeah or even uh, other kinds of action um there we hear the chimes yes yeah. <laughs> uh, so thank you. I was feeling about ready to stop anyway, so that's <laughs> perfect. Okay. Did you feel understood? I do. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So you select the person to speak to, Indy, and they'll reflect. You have five minutes. I thought I just did. Uh, you just reflected, uh, Lou. Oh. Oh, so now you get to. Hey, I express. selected the last person, though. Doesn't somebody? Doesn't Lou get to pick? No, you. You were. Well. With this process, you get to pick twice. <laughs> well, no, so, well, I think the thing is, you put the question in the circle. Okay, which question okay. You're going to talk about, but I spoke about it first, okay. and you reflected. Right. So that's your turn to speak. Okay, so I pick Minter then, and I ask him the same question. Oh, you can talk about anything you want. You can ask him a question, then he'll then just actually. No, no, you ask yourself this question. Oh, I ask myself you, this question. Or you that's could, good. or you could talk okay. about a different. If what I said makes you yeah. want to say, talk about something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, I will talk about this question then. Um, so my, uh, the world that I work in um, is full of people who uh, have difficulty uh, getting in the same space with each other. 
Uh, most of the time it's because we're in different time zones or different locations um, to your uh, mentor, your, your point of moving all over the place and speaking different languages. We're spread out all over the place. Um, and also the uh, kinds of things we're trying to get done are to understand great quantities of people, not just one other person. We want to try to understand um, lots of people um, and maybe understand how there might be different approaches and patterns of approaches in a whole lot of different people so that when we create something for them to use, um, we can create different things that will work for different ways of thinking and approaching things. Um, All right, so can I just reflect back? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I might lose the plot. So uh, you uh, are working on empathy, but you have the challenge that with the number of people you're working in, there's a geographical difference, a cultural difference. And then the second thing that renders it difficult is that you're, you're working with programming, if you will, or communicating to a large group of people, which um, makes yeah. hard for them to understand, to understand was, them. Rather, rather than communicating, listening, um, trying to gather an understanding from a large group of people. Um, and then I guess I do communicate it back, but to a much smaller team, like just 40 people or something. Um, so the difficulty is listening to a huge group of people that are obviously spread out and, and then condensing that and communicating it back to a team that's 40 people yeah. size. I, uh, I have a way that I do that, but um, I call it cognitive empathy, that I'm trying to build, uh, build an understanding. Well, I, I talk about how people like to walk, say empathy is walking in someone's shoes. And the teams that I work with love to jump into people's shoes, but they mostly do it by make-believe or what they've read or by one person that they've heard from. So what I do is I go help them learn how to develop empathy with that huge number of people, like the whole market that they're trying to support. Um, and uh, so the, uh, the, the way that I do it um, is to go have listening sessions with representatives from that very large set of people. Um, I then look for patterns across the, their own approaches. What I'm trying to understand is listening, not, um, because they're going through an emotion, but listening to what their inner thinking is as they had to accomplish some sort of a thing that they're trying, a purpose that they had. Like if they were in an accident and their purpose was, I want to make my life go back to the way it was before the accident, you know, sort of recover. Um, then how are you making your life go back to the way it was before the accident? So, you, you, with your team, when you're trying to build empathy, you see them thinking empathy is jumping in people's shoes, but it seems to be rather specific to one person as opposed to more generalized or at least a broader type of listening and, and which takes into context the other people's differences. And uh, you like to focus on cognitive empathy. I right? think, I think if that's the right word for it. <laughs> right. Where you are trying to understand what the other person's thinking. So if they had an experience and, and afterwards they wanted to revert back to a different experience or a different state, you're trying to make your team understand that that's what, that's the empathy that you want them to understand or get. Yeah, everything of, of that other person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically, and it doesn't. It isn't. I mean, that state thing was just one example. I have uh, tried to understand what goes through somebody's mind as they're trying to figure out if there's a bug in the software. I have tried to understand what goes through somebody's mind as they are. Uh, drilling an oil well, I have tried to understand what goes through a person's mind as they are cooking dinner um, or making a personal identity change um, or all sorts of, is that our chimes? 
<laughs> yeah, so you are, you obviously just meant that as one example. Yeah, yeah. You use other examples, whether it's uh, people drilling, not holes, but um, <laughs> drilling oil wells, or what goes through a mind when they're trying to figure out how to debug a, um, an irritating bug, mm-hmm. or uh, what goes through a person's mind is they're in the kitchen uh, handling three different, you know, um, sizzling frying pans at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just all sorts of different examples. Sure. So um, do you feel heard? Yeah. (laughs) Am I right in calling it cognitive empathy, though? That's the question. So you are asking whether you think that is cognitive empathy or whether that's the right expression. Mm -hmm. Well, surely we will discuss further. (laughs) So... um, Edwin, I yep. will uh, talk towards you. So I have been speaking about empathy on, on a number of occasions. I tend to have this opportunity to speak in front of audiences and I inevitably want them to understand what I believe is the powerful element of empathy. So you, on occasion, uh, speak in front of uh, large audiences and you're really trying to convey to them what you experience as the power of empathy. Right. And as opposed to being an expert on empathy, where I have no sociology or psychology degree of any of the sort, much like you, Indy, (laughs) what I focus on is the element of empathy that in a business context is powerful and and there i will focus on the cognitive side which is a language and a process that i believe is much more adapted and effective in a business environment Mm -hmm. so you are wanting to speak to what you see as a powerful aspect of empathy within the business environment so that's kind of what you're going to focus on Yeah, so when I talk about the definition of empathy, my focus is less on the feeling side of it, as in feeling what the other person's feeling or experiencing the emotion. It's it's more about getting into the other person's shoes and understanding their context. And, and that is what's powerful applied to business. Mm-hmm. So for you, the important part is not so much the felt experience or the emotion of, of people, but uh, putting yourself into the sort of the shoes and the, uh, getting a sense of the overall context that the person is experiencing. And that's what you see as very powerful. And the reason why I'm particularly set on that is that it's a vocabulary that works particularly well with sometimes crusty, sometimes male, pale, and or stale um, men that are brought up in a very rational environment and, and where emotions are a not part of their gig, not part of their gestalt, and think they have no place in work, which mm. I understand to be inaccurate, but mm. I so I, I think it's a language and a method that is more acceptable in the business environment. Uh, so this is uh, you're you're using this uh, aspect because it seems to communicate with with especially men who are you know very crusty, you know, controlling, rational, and this is sort of a language that uh, they you feel that they can understand and, and appreciate in the business world so that's why you kind of focus on this aspect and i can see very quickly the 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 scalability of that thought when you're dealing with a multiplicity of clients and and when you need to wire it down to some user experience or some code in some device where you, you you need to make selective choices whereas a i'm not a very effective empathetic empathic person so i don't feel other people's emotions but i'm good at observing them and and so maybe part of my bias 
is according to my inability to feel other people's feelings. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I, I really believe that if I can persuade business people, including women, uh, to gather and, and really focus on cognitive empathy, mm -hmm. it'll have tremendous knock-on value for their company and even when they go home in society. Mm -hmm. So you don't see yourself as a feeling person uh, and that uh, you're seeing that this being able to have this cognitive empathy, understand these contexts, that that is going to be really helpful for, for women, for everyone in the business environment, as well as if they take that home with them, that that'll be a benefit when they go home. I feel heard. Okay. <coughs> And, Can I say, oh my God, I'm doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even use the word feelings or emotions. I use the word reactions. And in the business sense, people can deal with that. Technically, you can't speak. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just so excited to hear that. <laughs> that's part of the process. Oh, let me speak to Lou. Uh, so part of the process okay. is to hold back, to you know, kind of hold back and not kind of interrupt the process. Because in a sense, you're kind of talking over someone. Like it was my turn, and I was just talked over in a sense. So, so I'm just kind of, so you want me to reflect that? Yeah, back? you would. Uh, so you're really, uh, you know, what I'm understanding from what you're saying is that um, you really want to let the process of the circle work, and mm -hmm. you, so you're trying to provide a little guidance to hold people to that, so that so that the people watching this and the people in the circle will um, uh, feel the benefit of that. Right. right? You're also telling us <coughs> that you were feeling a little bit uh, not good about. Uh, that it was your turn to speak and you wanted to be able to do that. Yeah, I would say that's part of the process of the empathy circle is it gives the person who's a, who's the speaker, it gives them sort of full attention. And if someone jumps in, even if they're excited about it and so forth, it sort of interrupts the, you know, their space. And it also can, the whole circle can sort of devolve. It's like, oh, this is an, we had rules. We had an agreement of how we're going to relate. Now the rules are thrown out. Whoever feels excited can jump in. So the whole circle can sort of blow up. So that's one of the concerns with, about sticking, at least to begin with, with the, the process. And I don't mean to, you know, I'm just explaining the, the dynamics of this. Yeah, so you're want, really wanting it to be understood <clears throat> what the benefits are of sticking to the process. Yeah. And so you're explaining that some, and you're saying you want to stick to it. <clears throat> and you're also saying that you don't want to be perceived as militant or controlling. Right. Uh, but, you want it, people, <laughs> but you want people to experience the benefits of the process. And, and one of the reasons for that is we're trying to convey this to people is that it's okay when we're all friends and kind of easygoing here, you know, but in terms of a, if we were doing an empathy circle with heavy conflict, it's like the whole thing would just blow up. It's like when people's emotions are just really strong. It's like, oh, they get to speak. When it's my turn, I'm going to interrupt them. And then all hell breaks loose in a heavy duty conflict. So that's one of the, the reasons to kind of get these basic, you know, agreements and sort of stay, stay with it. So I'm glad this was an opportunity to be able to share, you know, why we, we do what we're doing here. So I think you're saying that the, the structure of the circle also is designed to help uh, hold, provide a container for topics that are really charged. Yeah. And, and that that's another benefit of kind of sticking to it. And I would say, well, I, I, it's not my turn. No, you can't. <laughs> but, but, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you wanted, you wanted to make that clear too. Yeah. So uh, the other, so um, I did want to kind of bring it into the context too of what we're doing here. So that's sort of the empathy. It's like, it was like, it's my turn to be heard and empathized with, right? So for me to be able to share and be seen and sort of acknowledge. So I think that's part of empathy to be the receiver of empathy, to receiver of, you know, the full attention of everyone. So that is, you know, part of, of the definition of empathy to kind of as the receiver to receive the full uh, attention of, of the person that you're speaking, the speak, that you're speaking to, or the group for that matter. So um, I'm understanding you to say that for you, an important part of empathy 
and empathy in this process, circle process, is that the speaker gets the full attention of the reflector and actually everyone in the circle. And that, that um, uh, getting that full attention and really feeling like you are uh, being attended to and heard, that's an important aspect of, of empathy. Yeah. And uh, if you look at any of the, the academic material on empathy, it's like they all start with, there's a whole bunch of, there's a lot of definitions of empathy. It's a big morass in terms of there's no clear agreement. And I think that we can see that here, even in, the, in, in, in our little circle, that there is a lot of different understandings of what empathy is. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, so I'll just stop there for now. So um, you're saying that um, in the academic world, there are lots of different uh, definitions of empathy and lots of different people defining uh, kind of nuanced differences uh, in way of looking at it, and that um, uh, even in the circle here, you're hearing what you think is uh, differences in the way people are looking at it. Yeah, and one way of uh, clarifying, getting clear on that is to have these dialogues. You know, through the dialogue, we slowly get to understand what do we mean uh, by it, and it, it takes uh, it takes time to you know kind of get on the same to get sort of a mutual understanding, and it's really sort of through the dialogue that we can we can get that. So you have a lot of confidence that dialogue is a good way, doing this kind of process is a good way to uh, create more understanding about what empathy is or the different ways that people see it. And so you're, I'm guessing that's why you yeah. wanted to have this circle. Yeah, that's what we're doing here. So this is part of it. Like how can the four of us kind of get a sense of what we all mean by empathy because we're probably using all kinds of different understandings of it so yeah so you're hoping it results in us the four of us uh having new kinds of understanding of each yeah. other and of what empathy is and so for me the empathy is the in feeling you know the core root from the german in feeling so i, I see empathy as being very feeling oriented sensing uh being sensitive to felt experience uh so uh, for self empathy, for me, it's it's sensing into my own experience. Like, hmm, what am I feeling in this moment? I feel different senses within my body, and what's you know what's going on? I, I feel a little anxiety. Like, I have so much to say, and I'm not going to be able to say it all. So mm -hmm. I'm sensing a little. Oh, you know, I, I could feel that 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 energy, for example, in myself. So empathy for you, in terms of just, you know, you defining empathy, your definition of it, uh, has a lot to do with feeling for you, and it has to do with feeling into the other person. And, uh, and then you were just expressing what feelings are inside you right now, which is that you're feeling some anxiousness about uh, having a lot you want to say, and, you know, we, uh, we're taking turns, and, and you're feeling anxious about not uh, getting to say everything that you'd like. Oh, to. yeah, and feeling into myself. Like, I, I also felt a little anxiety by really coming down hard on Indy, you know? It's like, this is the rules. <laughs> so I felt I was putting force into that, you know, and like a real, you know, rigid sort of a structure, and I could feel anxiety come up inside myself from having that sense of, of, of that force in there. So that's the self-empathy is just sensing into the, the felt you know the bodily sensations that that I'm having for example that anxiety or so uh, so an important aspect of empathy for, to, uh, for you is self empathy which is feeling into your own what's going on uh, and uh, and expressing that um, and that that's an important part of empathy also yeah. And when Minter says, oh, I'm not a feeling person, I don't sense feeling, I think we have like 100% feeling, we're always feeling. And even thinking that you don't feel is maybe just feeling sort of a rigidity and a shutdownness, but you're feeling that. So we're, it seems to me we're always feeling, we might be, we're not calling, if we're controlling ourselves, you're not being sensitive, there is still the feeling of control. 
of our body and not being sensitive to others. So that's actually a, a felt experience. So I think that we're, we do have, we are all feeling all the time. And a lot of this, these people who are, you know, who mentor is talking about, they're all oh, they're crusty old men who don't have any, you know, afraid of emotions, but they do have a feeling. They have fear, maybe fear of emotion. They have a sense of controlling themselves. You know, their body is constricted and controlled. So they are feeling control. Um, so they, you cannot not sense. So we're all sensing all the time, but people sort of discount control as not sensing, but it is a, a sensation. So um, what I'm hearing you say now is that um, despite what some people might say and what Minter said earlier about uh, not wanting to emphasize feelings or thinking that some people actually don't have feelings, um, you're saying, no, that's not really true. Feelings mm -hmm. are part of being human. Everyone feels stuff. And whether they're willing to talk about it or whether they even sense it in themselves or whether they identify the experiences they're having as feelings and will name them as that, you know, all of that might be true that they don't do that, but it doesn't mean that they don't have feelings. Yeah. What they're, they're calling not, is they not, not be aware of it or they might not be willing to express it or they might not be naming it as feelings. Yeah, how am I on time? I feel like I've really talked a long you're time. Over. Okay, you're <laughs> over. stop yeah. me. Okay, well, and I, I let I let you go because you did all that stuff around okay. uh, the circle. So right, okay, thanks. Thank you. All right. Uh, wow, this is such a rich discussion. So I'll speak to Minter. You good with that? I am with you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm loving this discussion, and I just think it's really interesting. And uh, I, so I want to say that, and I kind of left this out of my, my definition of empathy. So, there is, so I do think, I talked about um, that for me, empathy is sensing a, people's, a person's feelings and their desires, okay? And by desires, I mean um, their values, uh, like what's important to them, the meaning that they're making of the situation, uh, what they wish for, hope for, dream for, you know, what, they, what their heart longs for, not in a feeling way, but in a meaning way. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. So first of all, you enjoying the way the conversation is, is evolving. And you uh, talked about um, understanding feelings and uh, desires and in desires the in meaning that you meant behind that would also include understanding their value system what's important to them and what is meaningful to them yeah and i would say actually uh in my view a good reflection of what someone is saying includes some of the information that they gave you, uh, the desires, meanings, values, whatever that they're expressing, and the emotions, whether those are implicit or explicit. And the most important component is the value slash meaning slash desire component. I know this comes out of actually my nonviolent communication training. So Marshall Rosenberg says 80% of a good empathic reflection has to do with the desire and the meaning. That's the most important part. And a lot of people misunderstand it, that they think the feeling is the most important part. And what the feeling tells you is, is the person being impacted positively or negatively? And is it a big impact or a small impact? That's the only importance in the feeling part. So I'll stop there. So, we are talking about empathy being a combination of understanding the feelings, the desires, and uh, the and so desires being the values and and the meaningfulness, as well as the emotions. And it's important for the person who's reflecting to understand all those, including the emotional aspect. Yet, in the, your NVC work, you ascribe 80% value to the reflection that focuses on the desires, quote unquote, component, which really focuses on values 
and it's the element of concordance or at least on the listening to the values that are coming through that's most important in the reflection yes thank you yeah and i think i mean because i've used i've done communication training and conflict resolution in the business environment and for sure you know or even not in the business environment, there are people who don't like having their feelings reflected. Like if you, if you reflect back their feelings, they'll say, no, 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 you know, they'll object to it. Say, I wasn't feeling that way or whatever, because they have some judgment of themselves or about the feeling component. And so if that happens, I just stop. I don't reflect back the feeling component. I notice it, but I don't, uh, but I don't reflect it back because the person doesn't like hearing that part. <laughs> so in, in conflict resolution, while you, you say it is important to have the, the feelings element and where, you know, what are you feeling is important where you can read it implicitly or explicitly. If they sort of start rejecting that and feeling it's sort of, or <laughs> start feeling that it's not the right feeling or feeling like their feelings are being encroached on, you kind of put it aside because where it's really happening is in the desires category. The, the desires being the sort of the, the title we're giving to this notion of values, meaningfulness. Yeah, and, and I would, you know, both you and Indy kind of indicated, kind of, well, you said cognitive empathy is what she named it, and you said using it in a big business context. Um, that uh, I think the... You know, so what I think is important in what I would call cognitive empathy is understanding what someone's thinking, like their ideas or their thoughts and the meaning that it's having for them. Um, but I do think, so it's not just the thought that's important, but what the thought means to the person or what their, what their values uh, and desires are relative to that thought. That's how you get people to, you know, agree or um, how you get people to be motivated or how you get people to um, connect with what's important or feel understood for what's important is by saying, by recognizing those things and uh, saying them. So, I want to say a pun, Indy indicated, uh, as uh, did I, that cognitive is important in a business world, yet understanding what the thoughts are is not quite as important as understanding how the thoughts are related to what is meaningful and, and bonding in the, 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 what you're thinking and feeling, presumably, and how that relates back to what's important to you in the desires area. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I just, one little more thing is, so I don't think the way I was describing empathy and the way you guys are, I don't think there's any conflict there at all. <laughs> so you don't think that it's incompatible with what we're suggesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for you listening. Are most welcome. So, um, Indy, I, I think it's interesting to split out understanding feelings and thoughts. At least um, it's curious that there should even be a distinction because I, I do fundamentally believe that feelings and thoughts are interwoven. And academically speaking, it's obvious that we operate through emotions. You're muted, Indy. I normally don't mute myself, so I forgot, sorry. So in an, it's, it's surprising that because at its root academically, emotion and thought are sort of all one thing, it's surprising that we're talking about empathy as sort of these two separate uh, th thoughts and, and meaning and emotion maybe desires and values could go into that side too. Well, I want, I'll get to that because I, I, okay, I find yeah. what Lou said about desires, that definition, wonderful. I hadn't really ever come across that as part of my study yet. Uh, I, I re it resonates with me. 
So the things that Lou was saying about uh, meaning, uh, desire, values, and sort of the definitions of that and how they hook into emotion is very valuable to you. Yeah. The area I'd like to explore is the notion of perception of empathy. In, in the way I look at it, empathy is merely an observation. The fact that you observe I'm being empathic is, is another concept. So uh, I, I, I could silently be behind a mirrored glass and see you, Indy. And, and I think, I, my belief is, that I could be empathic behind a mirrored glass mm -hmm. without your knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the mechanism of empathy within an individual's mind doesn't require that the other person see that you're having that mechanism happen. You could be behind the mirrored glass and still have empathy for the person on the other side that you're seeing and hearing. And, and I think that that is presumably linked to my filter and concept of working in a business mm -hmm. where being empathic behind a counter with a customer may not require any action. And in fact, that non-action is as empathic as it gets. So in the business situation, this is where that idea comes from, that um, that mechanism of empathy could actually be happening behind the counter for a customer and you don't actually mm, surface it and it's still empathy. Yeah, I, so this notion of manifesting or the transmissibility of empathy is, is of interest to me. And I explored it specifically in artificial intelligence where the opportunity can be to better understand and then make business decisions behind the glass window or in this case, a computer screen. Mm -hmm. Ha! <laughs> so the, um, the idea of an AI, some piece of algorithm, being able to be behind that mirrored glass, understanding, and being able to, well, you didn't say this, but possibly being able to function or make decisions based on its understanding through that glass. And I did say that uh, okay. in different words, so okay. thank you. I feel heard, Indy. <laughs> wow, this is great, thank you. Um, so now I select somebody to speak to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think, can I speak right back to Minter? Is that? Yep, whoever you want. Okay. So to Minter, um, the, the, I'm trying to let this filter through and I didn't get enough time. <laughs> um, the, okay, I'm going to take it in this new direction. Um, this idea of uh, emotion, the idea of the values and desires, the idea of understanding someone's thinking, the idea of being able to do that without actually being present, physically located with that person and reacting or surfacing and manifesting that empathy um, is very valuable. Um, for a business because that is a lot of the way that we interact with people through a screen. Um, so if I could, yeah. so you're, first of all, you're enjoying this, but you're going to take it down a different path. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so you're, we've got these three elements. You've got the, the, the thoughts, the feelings, the desires, and you're suggesting that in business in any event, the option and the opportunity to manifest it doesn't, it's rarely the case because we have an interface that maybe hides us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that being said, I have noticed 
a lot of pushback against the word empathy in the business world, in the technology world, uh, and a, an adoption or embracing of the word compassion instead. The way that people are defining compassion uh, is a little bit mystifying to me because it sounds a lot like cognitive empathy. Um, and then uh, I also hear people, I have a neighbor who is a meditation teacher and she defined compassion exactly the way Lou was defining the more face-to-face -face empathy. And so, yeah, go ahead. So in business or in your business circles, you're getting pushback on, on using the term empathy and, and you, you, you see them sort of swapping it in for compassion or wanting to talk about compassion, which was closer to the way Lou in another circle with your neighbor. Right. The neighbor. Was closer to what Lou was saying, which is um, face to face. Mm -hmm. Which, um, so there's confusion. <laughs> the bottom line is there's confusion <laughs> the bottom line is there's in the confusion. definitions. Yeah. And so I'm confused about what is compassion, what is the difference. Um, I'd like to be able to, my own approach is very uh, conciliatory. I try to, I don't like arguing. Uh, and so this, <laughs> the mere fact that people are arguing about it <laughs> disturbs me. Um, so what I want to do is learn how to speak of them together and make everybody in the room feel comfortable uh, with, the, with the thing behind it, the mechanism behind it, the way we're going to use it. Um, so just when you said them, you're confused about them, what were the two things? The, the two things were uh, the word empathy and the word compassion. I, I'm getting the sense that the background, the meaning behind it is fairly similar. But I right, want, so, yeah. So you, you'd like a little bit of clarity behind both of these concepts so that we can operate with clarity, at least, you know, together. Because right now you're feeling that they are similar. There's a relationship between them in any event. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, uh, I guess, uh, I, other than that, can I just say I feel heard? <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So Lou. Yeah. Um, I have had a lot of fun trying to present what is empathy to large organization, large audiences. And I, I make a point of honor to distinguish between empathy and compassion, empathy and sympathy by focusing on the notion of the perception and, and staying anchored to the idea that it is an observation of the other and the observation being broadly listening, looking, hearing what's happening in front. So, um, so you, you, um, uh, talk about empathy and you try to help, uh, large groups of people in, in business and in other venues understand what empathy is. And, um, you try to draw a distinction between empathy and sympathy and compassion and, uh, and a large part or main part of your, the way that you communicate your perspective has to do with uh, defining empathy as perception, uh, a way of observing what's going on with another person. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think that neutrality serves my purpose and, and certainly orients my approach in a business context because it allows me to talk about empathy without getting into wishy-washy, teary-eyed conversation where I was brought up not to cry if I cut my knee. And, and it's a kind of attitude that I felt I learned from a lot of individuals who went through the Second World War. And I appreciate 
and and maybe it's my filter but i also believe it is the language that's best suited for suited c suites so so um in talking about empathy in a business context you think it's really important to uh, be you said be neutral, and I think you mean emotionally neutral, uh, and not not emphasize feelings, but emphasize this observation and perspective taking, because a lot of people have had the cultural experience of learning that you know feelings. It's there's some strength in learning to set feelings aside, and also just other people who are uncomfortable with talking about feelings because of their cultural background, and so your experience is that it there's a great strength in talking about this without really emphasizing emotions a lot yes yeah, so there are two more things i want to say the first is that that empathy can be employed in many circumstances some of which are, are deeply troubling and and for example having to fire somebody and and so rather than go down with the ship uh, like a doctor having to talk to somebody who's going to die, where you need to provide some distance with that unfortunate situation, that uh, you can still use empathy by being observational rather than go down with them into their abyss. So um, what you're saying now is that the what you're calling observational empathy or empathy as perception or observation of what's going on you think there's a lot of strength in that practice for difficult situations like if you had to fire someone it helps provide a uh, a, 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 a compassionate distancing which allows the person to like do the thing with some compassion but not get overly not lose control of themselves because of whatever emotion they might be feeling or the situation. Yeah, yeah, and the situation. Okay. So on the one hand, I was talking about that the use of empathy in, in a variety of circumstances, including difficult situations and decisions that need to be made in business. On the other hand, why I think empathy is beautiful is that it's deeply personal. And I think in, in a business environment, what I'm trying to angle at is allowing for personal personality, humor and emotion to exist, but it's my angle in it's, it's my doorway into that discussion so that I, I move a rational person into understanding empathy, which ultimately will open the door to being personal and allowing emotions. So I, I, what I'm, I think what I'm hearing is you're, you're acknowledging that emotion is a key part of human beings and an important part of human beings and an important part of creating what you called deep, deep conversation or deep connection, something about something like that. Uh, and so um, um, you're saying that emotion is important but I'm not sure if you're saying it's only certain kinds of emotion like humor and no, whatever. I yeah. So that, that specifically what I was talking about was bringing emotion into business, sorry, empathy into business is a doorway into ultimately understanding the power of personal personality, including things like sense of humor, crying emotions, and all the other things that come with a person. And, and the, so there's a path that we go from a rational, I'm intelligent, I know how to do numbers kind of person, to understand that empathy, you don't need to be personal, don't need to be emotional, just understand the other. And, but once you get into that understanding of the other, it necessarily leads you into understanding emotions and hopefully understanding personalities, persons, sense of humor, and so on. Okay, so if I'm understanding what you're saying, that the way that you like to introduce empathy in a business context is by starting with this observational kind of thing, you're, uh, and leaving the emotion, actually the emotional part of it to the end. <laughs> uh, you allow people to feel safety in 
observing things and recognizing them and then to get more and more um, closer to the emotions which help connect people because we are human beings are emotional beings is that right but it, uh, yes and if you start with the emotions you get a yeah. door you get a cross so right. it's just a conduit okay i feel yeah. heard yeah thank you Lou. Great. thank you uh okay so i'll talk to edwin are you listening <clears throat> uh, uh so i'm continuing to love this conversation and i totally agree with minter that um you know um, I mean, it kind of fits with what I was saying is that if I, if I talk to someone and I see that they are not enjoying me reflecting their feelings, or even if I just get a sense of them as a person who is, you know, doesn't enjoy, isn't expressing a lot of feelings, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't be reflecting that back. That's part of mirroring kind of where they are. Um, I think that, um, I could reflect that back. I'm, yeah, I'm sure, hearing yeah. you're really enjoying this conversation and sort of resonating with Minter that if if you sense someone who does is not enjoying or feels uncomfortable with you reflecting back what they're saying, that you want to have sort of a sensitivity to that and sort of react appropriately that doesn't impose yeah. on I'm, them. Right, and I would focus much more on meaning and and values. Um, than on, on than on emotions. Um, so you talk more about uh, ideas and meaning yep. instead of focusing on what they're feeling. Yep. Okay. Um, I think that um, I thought something that was very interesting that came up before was had to do with what I perceived as what are the uses of empathy. So the idea that I might observe someone from behind a glass. And I could be feeling empathy towards them, even though they're not receiving it. So that is using empathy. That's using my, my ability to sense into what another person is feeling and thinking and what meaning it has for them. And I might be using that for something. So I'm watching them and I'm writing it down because I'm going to use it in the way I design something. So the purpose there is using empathy to create something that I think is going to be meaningful to someone else not the purpose is not to help them feel understood and accepted or heard or you know to make a connection hmm. and and you can you can use empathy even when the person's not present at all like if i'm a if i'm a coder or i'm a designer and i'm designing as a user interface and i'm imagining a person using it so i'm not even present with them i'm just using my imagination to put myself in that you know so I think empathy has to do, and I, I would say compassion the same here. I just realized I'm not pausing at all. Um, uh, it has to do with a desire to understand the other person. Mm, so you're saying um, that empathy and compassion has to do with understanding the other, and it's not necessarily uh, just having them feel like they've been heard, but you could be, if you have a glass between you and them, they don't even know that you're hearing and understanding them but you could be designing something to contribute to them. So you're yes. sort of differentiating these different aspects of, of empathy. Correct. And, the, and then the purposes it could be used for. So oh, mm -hmm. a, pur a purpose might be to help a person feel accepted and understood and connected like they belong, or it might be for the purpose of designing something you think is going to serve people or terribly empathy can be used to take advantage of people. So this is what con, con artists do. They use their capacity to sense the desires and the feelings of others so that they can get them to do things that they wouldn't do otherwise. I mean, it could be used for really bad, you know, evil purposes. Mm -hmm. So you're having a whole spectrum of how empathy could be used. You could be listening to someone to uh, have them feel heard. You could just be empathizing with them, observing them uh, to design something that contributes to them, or you could be using it for nefarious reason terms uh or like con artist or something yes so just having these there's a whole spectrum of how this empathy can be applied yes thank you the another point i wanted to uh, make was about the difference between thoughts and feelings are they separate or are they together interwoven so i do think of them as separate and i think that the if i have a thought 
meaning that I'm making a certain meaning of a situation. <laughs> like, let's say I'm in a situation, I'm having a conversation, all of a sudden says some, someone says something to me, and I, the meaning I'm making of it is I'm being rejected, you know, or I'm being attacked. Then the feelings that come up in me as a result of that are fear or anger or whatever. So the, I do think that um, they're connected in that one stimulates the other. But I, but I am in my own mind or my own being, I am able to separate those, those mm -hmm. things. So you separate thoughts and feelings being two different things. And so, yeah, that's kind yeah, of the essence the, of it. Because the same stimulus can result in a different thought and, and or a different feeling in a different person. It just depends on, you know, have the meaning they're making. Oh, uh, so one, th one comment or something can have different uh, thoughts and feelings, stimulate different thoughts and feelings in different people. So different things would, would come up. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Um, I'll speak to Indy. Here. Unmute. Okay. Uh, wow. Uh, I guess what I just, I'll build on what I just heard about thoughts and feelings. What, what I'm interested in is the, the feelings connected to thoughts. Uh, and I think that, I don't think you can have a thought without feelings associated with it. You know, as a human, as a human being, you have a thought. If you're sensitive enough, you can, you can articulate the feelings that are associated with that thought. So <clears throat> you saw my eyes go back up in my head. <laughs> I think you said when you have a thought, there's almost always a feeling associated with it. You may not be aware of it, but you can probably suss it out. Yeah. And I know there's this big thing, thoughts, feelings being, being separate. And I think it's not that easy that they sort of are sort of intertwined. And, um, and I've had thought of like, doing a doing some kind of like a, a article or something on the feeling of reason like asking people like what does feeling what does reason feel like and i've actually had done that had interviewed people and you know about it and they say well reason feels secure i feel safe you know i feel grounded i feel so they, they start associating a lot of different feelings to the idea of reason so I think it's not, you know, the, the separation uh, is not as clear as, as sort of the culture wants us to, to uh, think. Hmm. Okay, so I think uh, our, our culture at least believes in this difference between reason and feelings, and yet you even did some research and you were starting to write an article about the feeling of reason, like yeah. how you know, those feelings are associated with it. So you think it's intertwined. Yeah, and I think a, a lot of the, the, this about that there is a feeling associated to reason and people can feel like, oh, I am, uh, they can be prideful. I am reason, I'm reasonable. And there's a feeling of pride to them. Reason, this using this process has pride attached to it. It has, uh, has a, a safety attached to it so it it has uh it has um um you know feelings of i don't know what, uh, what yeah yeah just mention those two there's there's a lot of other feelings that okay, might so be yeah, con continuing on with the this essay or article you were writing the there are a lot of feelings that go along with the concept or the meaning of reason for people and sometimes i it seems to me that like there's this notion that oh um reason is this thing beyond feelings and i'm for me that it's it's connected and intertwined with feelings there's all kinds of feelings associated with with it and um and sometimes the feeling that's associated with it is control that we are able to control other emotion other feelings so there's the feeling of control and that control makes you feel safe. It makes you feel, you know, grounded. It makes you feel protected. And so what we're talking about when we're talking about reason, we're talking about control. Uh, so that when feelings come up, that you'll have be able to control emotionally, physically control those feelings and they won't be able to just fill your, your body. So this is connected to what Mincha was saying earlier was you're saying, uh, the, the, 
concept of reasoning, at least in our culture, is very associated with the concept of being able to control what's happening, what you're feeling, how others are feeling, how things get done, maybe. Yeah, but the control is a feeling. You can feel control in your body. The body is, has a certain mental, you know, bodily rigidity to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and it seems to me that it's kind of used as a way of, of, of giving precedence. It's a way of saying, oh, this is beyond feelings, and we're going to give precedence to this. It's, it's a feeling, but we're going to use this gimmick to say that reason is not feeling associated, and it gives extra protection to the feeling of control. Uh, it, I don't know, it's getting pretty weird. <laughs> but I've, I, but it, it, so it seems very central to... <laughs> okay. Like a, a, a judgment that our culture makes that reason is more important or yeah. than feelings. But it's really a feeling. You're giving more, you know, weight uh, to, to this feeling of reason. So, um, so I guess that's something I've been trying you know, try to work out. So that's the, uh, and, and there was, uh, you know, Mincho was talking about being emotionally neutral observation, setting feelings aside. To, to be neutral is a feeling. There's a felt experience in being neutral. Like you can, if you say, are you feeling neutral now? Can you describe the felt experience of being neutral? It's like, I feel, you know, I feel distance. I feel distance from the feelings, other people's feelings. So you can feel the distance uh, between you and the other feeling. So. so you're frustrated that throughout our culture, we are not recognizing that uh, thought is can actually have a felt experience yeah. associated with it. And I think that's part of the empathy is that empathy is is saying that feeling, sensing is important that there, and that it's how we sense into. Can I sense into someone's neutrality? Can I sense into uh, their joy of reason or logic or you know can I be sensitive to just the full experience, you know deeply sensitive? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying uh, out, out of frustration, maybe empathy, if I, I can teach people they can sense into uh, the moment to the other person, then, then they'll start to see how intertwined everything is and they'll leave off judging emotions as being inferior. Yeah. And even judgment has a feeling to mm -hmm. it, right? You can even feel somebody's judgment and sense the, the feeling that the, the sensations associated with judgment. So I don't know if we can really, you know, if you're really sensitive, just, just, you can always associate, and I'm not very that good at naming the, the felt experience associated with everything that's going on in, 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 in me, but uh, I, I just see the, how that it can be done. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're saying that you, you know it can be done, you may not have the, the words for naming the felt experience, but it is there and you want to help people understand how to see it. Yeah, I want to get better at it myself. And, and uh, like the process of focusing, which comes from Gene Genlin, who is a student of Carl Rogers, that is what the whole process is about is instead of here talking about all these ideas is talking about the felt experience in the moment that I'm feeling right now. And, you know, have, being able to express that instead of the, yeah. So that's, uh, that's just the process, the focusing <laughs> process, which is a highly, you know, sense oriented practice that I think is kind of the essence of self empathy. So perhaps what you're saying is that you're trying to get better at it by practicing this focus um, uh, to be able to focus in on the, the felt experience. Yeah, well, it's a process called focusing from Jean Genlin. It, it's basic, I would call it actually, instead of focusing, they could have called it self-empathy, would have perhaps mm. been a bit better. Okay. So I don't know how I'm so, doing on time. Yeah. Oh, time, okay, I feel okay. heard. Okay, yeah, great. We were muted. So, so we yeah, we were both. We both looked at you. We're like, oh, we're not going to be able to hear the chime. <laughs> He's still muted. Okay. Uh, I think I select someone to listen, or should we? Okay. 
Um, how is everybody doing on time? Because we've gone over our hour. I'm okay. We I, were going I, for I, two I thought hours. we were going until noon. But I'm... Yeah, we had two hours. I don't know if you were... Oh, I only had one hour on mine. Um, Mintar, are you okay? Because you're in the different time zone. I'm with you. I booked it out. Okay. All right. Cool enough. Um, I missed that part. <laughs> My life has been crazy. Uh, so I pick someone then and I ask... I keep losing the thread. How do I do this? <laughs> yeah. um, so you can, it's your turn to speak and you can speak okay. about whatever you want. Speak and about you whatever I want. Pick, okay. pick someone to okay. reflect you back. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so, um, all right, Lou, I will pick okay. you. Um, right. And I think that uh, I've learned, I, I'm picking up a lot, um, picking up a lot of, um, parallels i'm picking up a lot of everybody's sort of looking into the same like how how do thoughts and and emotions go together how do we speak about that how do we use this vocabulary for better in the business um and i'm i'm just so excited because that all matches what i'm doing the way that i teach people how to break the data down qualitative data is not it's frowned upon in the business world quantitative data gives you you know, these black and white numbers, but it doesn't tell you why. Qualitative data tells you why, and I have to teach people how to actually treat qualitative data as rigorously as they treat quantitative data. There is a rigorous way to do it. Part of the rigor that I do is I go through transcripts and I try to understand like what's the thought and what's the emotion coming from it, or what's the emotion that's causing the thought, and I, and I tell people, it doesn't matter if you label it emotion or thought, just I want you to pull those out separate from the opinion or the explanation how, which are the things that they usually pull out of qualitative data. Okay, so let me try and reflect back what I've heard so far. So you're enjoying the conversation and you're hearing a lot of um, alignment with uh, things that you understand and, and things that you do with what other people are saying and that, that excites you. Um, I'm also hearing that you, in the work that you do, uh, you have a lot of people that focus on quantitative data and just looking at that, and you're really trying to help them understand how to use qualitative data in a rigorous way to make decisions because the quantitative data can give you some indicators, but it doesn't tell you why, and the why is really important for solving the problem in a way that's meaningful. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, yeah. And then the um, the sort of the thought versus emotions, I actually break it down into inner thinking, reaction, I use the word reaction because it's safer, mm -hmm. uh, and guiding principles, which kind of comes back to your idea of the desires or the values. Um, I'm, uh, I don't remember how I came up with those three things, but I'm looking for those three things in transcripts and ignoring the preferences, the opinions, the, the explanations how, which is how normally people look at qualitative data. They don't think to go to that deep level, and in fact, they don't think to collect that deeper level. So when I'm teaching people how, how to do a listening session, I'm teaching them how to sense when someone, notice when somebody is talking about something that there's depth to, and to help them talk about what that depth is, what the inner thoughts are, what the reactions are, what the guiding principles are. Um, the guiding principles might come from superstition, they might come from values, they might come from some sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, role model or, or motivation, external motivation, that kind of a thing that can come from, but I'm thrilled that it's sort of as intertwined um, because we're so human. Let yeah, me try to reflect this back. So I, I think what I'm hearing is you saying that you, um, when you're working with people to try to help them understand qualitative data or do a listening session, you're trying to help them shift away from their own internal judgments about what they're seeing, uh, shifting to trying to sense into the other person uh, what thoughts and what uh, reactions, not feelings, but what reactions they're having and what meaning they may be making of it or what values are being expressed um, 
because that represents the depth of well, like what's important to them. And um, uh, is was there more than that, or was that the, that's, yeah, that's that the gist it, of it? Okay, basically the gist of it. Um, just the the idea that we're all sort of following the same thing. So the question, I guess, uh, I, I feel like um, like I'm not going down the wrong path, <laughs> which is reassuring. Um, I feel like other people are following this path uh, in, in the business world, which is also awesome because we all have, there's going to be an army. We have to all do it. <laughs> um, I tell people it's not going to happen in our generation. It's going to be another generation or two. Um, uh, it's a long haul. We'll make it. But um, this idea of compassion, like this little war, there are certain people who are... Mm, male leaders within the community of user experience who say empathy you should not be doing empathy you should be doing compassion how do I help how do I help them realize it's the same thing and stop saying destructive things like that so what I got in this last piece was that you're excited about the fact that the things that you're doing seem to be validated by the things that other people have said, that there's alignment um, and uh, that makes sense to you because it works for you. And, but also that the work that you're doing to try to help people understand those things more is connected for you to a larger purpose of trying to make the world a better place or trying to end, and that you think that's not going to happen right away, that it's going to take a generation or two. Um, and that you're really interested in having leaders uh, who speak negatively about uh, empathy to mm -hmm. try to help them view that in a different way. And they're using the word compassion, but to, to get to try to help them to see it's the same thing. Yeah, I feel heard. Okay, thank you. So I'll talk to um, Minter. So I want to say that I think the reason people are afraid of empathy, the word empathy, is because they, because they think it means feelings, and it means that they have to talk about their feelings, and it means that feelings are more important than anything else, and that maybe because people feel a certain way, it means we have to do it that way. And, you know, people are going to feel different ways about all kinds of stuff, so how do you, you know, if I feel one way and you feel another way, how are we going to resolve that conflict? And I think so I think um, uh, I think that's why people are afraid of the word empathy, and I think empathy means something much deeper than that, and it is much more. I like I was saying, it's really eighty percent the meaning, you know, and the values and the desires, that deeper stuff that people care so deeply about, and they do have emotions associated with those deep feelings, but you can talk about the those deep things without naming the feeling you don't, you don't have to name the feeling so i mean that's that's how i think of empathy and i like you all there are times when i will not i'm used talking to a group and i will not use the word empathy because for that very same reason because i'm worried that they'll think it means you know i now i have to talk about my feelings and i don't want to do that so i'm leaving <laughs> you know or i'm not participating in this all right so you do not, or are you, so a lot of people are worried or fearful of the word empathy because they believe that it's all about just feelings. And, and you are, you will even go so far as not to mention the word empathy because of that kind of a reaction or that kind of association with feelings. Because in the end of the day, in any event, what you think is most important within the concept of empathy and the one, you know, which your work you mentioned before about non-binary communication. It's all about the attachment of those feelings potentially, but the attachment to values and, and, uh, and desires. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that um, um, So I wanted to address what Edwin was saying before about the, the feeling of reason, you know, that there's a feeling associated with reason. So I, I just want to say that I think, so my experiences, it isn't just that I think, my experience of working with different people 
to help them understand what's going on in themselves, to have empathy for themselves and have empathy for others. My experience has taught me that people have different emotional reactions or different feelings uh, on, this, on the same thought and it depends on their life experience. So Edwin might feel that when he's feeling reasonable or someone else is, he's judging them as being reasonable, that that gives him a feeling of comfort that helps him calm down and he feels confident and he feels whatever you feel in your body. But other people that were raised, let's say in a, in a family where reason was all that mattered, feelings were not, were rejected completely and it was a totally rational environment. When they hear someone being really rational, that might make them really uncomfortable and they might get really upset and be, you know, it might set them off. Uh, and they might like to do crazy stuff, like their life might be full of just crazy, they like to do crazy wild things that are completely irrational, because that's their, that was their only way of escaping the, con that con the control. Right, um, so, um, in the separation between emotion and thought, uh, or their interrelationship, um, what you observe in your experience has led you to understand that you can have a specific action, if you will, but people react to it differently. So for in this particular case, Edwin might be more comfortable in a feeling environment and his experience has led him to understand that feelings are fine and rational is uncomfortable. Whereas another person to the same situation, uh, or at least to, in their reaction might be more rational and that's perfectly fine for them. Whereas rational to Edwin, who might be more comfortable in a feeling environment uh, is they, they, they feel more comfortable in the rational response. Um, that's close. It's really more that there, uh, p there can be a stimulus. So the stimulus could be somebody giving an explanation or the stimulus could be me having a thought, uh, or the stimulus could be, uh, a, be, a, be a piece of behavior, somebody goes to hug me, or a sound. So it could be any kind of stimulus. And the way I respond to that stimulus, the meaning that I make of it, and so the, the emotional reaction in me to it will be based on what, I, what my past experience is. Yeah, so the like, way you, you react to a stimulus will necessarily be based on your own experiences, your own experience set, your data set, if you will. Yeah. And that's, that's going to form how you respond to it and what you're going to, let's say, focus on, whether it's emotion or rational. Right. Yeah, for instance, a very simple example, the sound of the timer going off. So some people might hear the timer and feel relieved because they're nervous about speaking and whatever. And so they feel some, another person hears the timer go off and they feel angry because they feel constrained by like, why should I have to stop talking? You know, people are always trying to control me. I don't like being controlled. Same stimulus. People have different thoughts and different emotional reactions to it. Yeah. So for the example of the buzzer going off for some, it, it can be a, a pleasant experience for others. It can be a less pleasant experience based on, what that buzzer, you know, how it connects back into your prost. Right. Okay. Thank you. I feel heard. You are welcome. Edwin. So mm -hmm. listening, I am of the mind to push in, in one area, which is uh, the neutrality of the perception. And, and why I think that's relevant in mediation, relevant in business in particular, and then in decision-making. Because what you want to do is relate to the other, but not be judgmental about what you're observing. And therefore the distancing with your own thoughts and feelings will allow you to have a better reading of what's going on in the other person's shoes. Mm -hmm. So you want to talk about uh, the benefits of uh, neutrality and in mediation, it would give you more space 
to really see what's going on in them. So you're not kind of getting emotionally, your own feelings sort of getting involved, kind of creating a space so you can see what's happening with them. And, and in a business world where I tend to roll, if you're having to give bad news to somebody, uh, you you want you don't want to be going down with them. So you, you stay neutral, but that doesn't mean that you don't understand that they have feelings. You don't you don't you, you don't see their feelings, and the, the 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 notion is to capture what you're seeing, but not judge it. And that's where I mean by the neutrality of your observation, because otherwise, if I'm seen, seen as judging you, or oh, you're an emotional idiot, you know, if that's what I'm giving off as body language, that is not going to go down well. So in a business environment, it's really useful and necessary to be able to, to dissociate yourself uh, and yet be fully observational and intentional in your listening. Mm -hmm. So it's really helpful in a business context to be observational. And if instead of if you're seeing some emotion, anger or something come up from the other person, that you're not judging it. And also that you're not sort of like taking it on yourself. So to be specific, if I, if I hear you say something that pisses me off, it'll, this will cloud my ability to decide on something. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you may not even have been pissed off about what you're saying. You're, you're explaining something that's true to you. So if I'm now saying, well, that is a data point for a decision that I now need to take on, I've completely lost what Edwin was thinking. And I just completely submersed it in whatever I was attaching to that, the emotion that I'm giving to it. Mm -hmm. So instead of just staying present with what the person is saying, that you kind of give it, you, you, you kind of get involved in your own sort of reaction to it and, and you, the own values or whatever that you give it instead of just staying present with them. That's right. And so there are two more pieces. One is that it doesn't, should not eliminate your desire, your ability to be emotional in, in a reaction. For example, if you see a bug on a screen in a, on, a, on an internet site, then it pisses the hell out of you. Well, hallelujah, get, get pissed. And if you are really operating as if in you're in the customer's shoes, so it's not your site, you're going in as a customer to visit this person's site that happens to be owned by you. But if you can experience the, the anger that the, <laughs> that the individual's experiencing as if they were there, but they're not, it, you can get into their shoes and, and think it through as if you were in there, they were in their shoes doing that bad experience on your site. That's a great thing. Mm -hmm. So a real benefit is if you can put yourself in someone else's situation, their shoes in a sense, see something that they might experience, sense the reaction in yourself, and then kind of you have that information to work with. And that's really helpful and good yeah. thing. So that, that, that's an allowance of, of emotion. Mm -hmm. And the final piece, oh, mm -hmm. which is complicated, is the ability to enunciate emotions and feelings, which you, you mentioned before, the ability to name the yeah. feeling. And in a business environment, when I can't enunciate it clearly, that's room for confusion. So I like to stay in the cognitive space and the thinking space because it's a zone that is more viable in a business space. Again, I, I do not put aside emotion, but in a, in, a, in a voyage that is moving, let's say more rational, predisposed to business school, legacy people, to get them to understand the power of emotion and personal, you need them to, 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 to follow your path. And, and that means to understand what you're saying, I'm not getting confused by the way I'm expressing my emotions or anything. There's a, there's a, a clarity in the expression that brings them along and they trust you. And that's the journey that allows them to finally get into emotions 
where we've created a common vocabulary and understanding. Mm -hmm. So with, in the business environment, do you want to have sort of create a space of clarity so that it's easy for others to follow along with you? And as they follow along with you, you can sort of lead them into uh, perhaps a deeper, richer felt experience. Uh, and so Edwin, at the beginning of this session, I know my time is up, but you did say that we should observe empathy in our group. So two observations. The first is sometimes one of us is speaking, but everybody's nodding. And, and I don't know if that's empathy, but I thought I wanted to observe that. And yeah. second of all, in your reformulating what I just did, you also mirrored or at least uh, sh showed the, the visual elements of what I was saying, as well as what the words that I was saying. Okay, so you're, you're tying it in with uh, the actual experience we're having here, and you're just identifying that you saw nodding. As, as, and so just identifying that and, you know, what it, what it, just asking what that meant, but just acknowledging it. And the other was the mirroring of me physically mirroring what you had done. And that's another thing that you're tying it into what's actually happening here in the moment. Exactly. I feel heard. Okay. Um, I'll speak to Lou, I guess. Um, okay. This might be the one, one or two last rounds. Um, yeah. So... That, I'm glad that Minter brought that into what we're doing in the moment because that's sort of what I had hoped we would do more of in terms of what is it that we're actually doing in the moment that, and naming that, you know, putting words to it. So, um, yeah, I'll just start with that. So you're, uh, you're really feeling happy that uh, Minter brought in this thing of noticing what was going on in the moment and talking about it because that was something that you wanted to be part of this. Yeah, and the I see the empathy circle is you know really a I'm saying it's like the best gateway empathy practice like this practice here uh, you know it takes time I mean I know Indy thought it was an hour but it's like it needs like two hours and even longer to sort of settle into it and start to get into this deeper sort of uh, you know empathic connection so I yeah there's kind of two parts to that. Yeah, so you have a lot of um, uh, confidence and faith in em this practice that we're doing, the Empathy Circle practice, as kind of a foundational practice to understanding empathy, building capacity for that, and experiencing it. And um, uh, and I lost the second piece. Um, that uh, About the time. It takes a lot of time oh. to sort of sink into this. It's, right. it's not like a quick practice. It, you know, it... It takes, I mean, I, I'm so, I feel like we're just starting to get going here. <laughs> yeah, and, and empathy, empathy takes time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And um, so in terms of just quickly naming, uh, I see the self-empathy is sensing, you know, what's happening inside myself. So I feel a little anxiety about the time. I'm feeling sort of a sense of spaciousness. Uh, I'm feeling a sense of sort of connection with everyone here. So I'm... I'm, yeah, that's part of my feeling into my own experience, sort of a self-empathy. So, so you're naming that an important part of the process for you is feeling into yourself or what you call self-empathy. And that means noticing the emotions that are going on, the physical sensations that are going on, and that you're feeling some anxiety about the time right now, but you're also feeling uh, some connection. Mm -hmm. And also the other empathy would be that you empath hearing me, I feeling a sense of you really f being present, listening to me, uh, you know, the reflection is just, it really helps, you know, in that sense of feeling like you're sort of, that you're accompanying me on my journey here. And so I really feel your presence. I feel sort of an empathy from everyone else, sort of a in the room, sort of a moving along with what I'm, I'm feeling. So I, I'm feeling that empathy and that presence from everyone else. So right now you're just describing how you're experiencing what's happening, which is that, you know, my looking at you and my body language, my head shaking and my, uh, the reflecting back that I'm doing, that is you're feeling heard by that. You're feeling me that I'm with you. And you're also noticing that um, uh, among others. And so you're yeah. feeling, you're feeling uh, a part of. 
and feeling supported, I think. Yeah, it feels good. It actually has a, I feel, a, yeah, sort of a, so the other uh, form of empathy is, I know sometimes it's called cognitive empathy, but I would call it imaginative empathy. So, and that's putting ourselves in someone else's shoes in terms of a role play. And Mentor had mentioned that, you know, being in front of the, t the uh, screen and seeing a bug as, as the other person. So I, I'm sort of putting myself into Indy's uh, sense that she had a lot of stuff dealing with her uh, house, with the roof. Uh, you know, she, uh, there's a time she thought it was an hour, so it's kind of going over. Maybe there's a little bit of concern there. So I'm, I'm sort of sensing, sort of imagining what, th what this call might be like for her, that she might have things, you know, that she needs to be doing. So I would call that imaginary. I'm sort of stepping into her shoes in that sense, sort of as a role play and sort of imagining what, what the, you know, what this might be like for her. So, so now you're describing an aspect of empathy, uh, which you call imaginative empathy, and um, you think maybe it might be the same as what Minter and Indy were calling cognitive empathy, mm -hmm. which is the idea of not necessarily directly experiencing, but imagining into what someone else might be feeling and thinking and experiencing, uh, and whether that person is present or not. Up oh, and that was in my time, so in there I have so much more to say. <laughs> you want to say one more little piece? Oh, the, the last part was culture of empathy, which is the overall culture. Like there's four of us here, we have the screen, we have the environment, and there's sort of this whole sense of how do we create a greater degree of empathy within the whole context of the culture that we're in. And so that would be like another term that I use as a culture of empathy or sort of relation, you know relational empathy so so cultural empathy i mean uh, creating a culture of empathy is also a concept that's very important to you and that you try to promote and that has to do with you know how how do we create an environment and norms cultural norms around um expressing empathy and being empathic uh and like doing this practice is is one of the yeah one of the i feel heard so we're probably going to need to end there. Maybe just do a quick, you know, each person a minute. Just uh, re how, how was the experience uh, before we close? Um, anybody wants to jump in? So I'll go. I mean, I, this is a wonderful conversation. I could keep going. I, I do have more I wanted to say. I wanted to add a couple of notes. But I, I think what's uh, actually strongest in me is um, seeing the – so I have this thing that, you know, Anybody that does something that works, they're they're operating on the same principles. And so when I, you know, I hear Indy's had success in doing what she's doing, and Minter's had great success in what he's doing. And so when we look at underneath, you know, we may be using different words or slight things, but what I got from listening is, you know, we're all operating on the same principles. Um, and a lot of the things that Minter described that are sound to do in business, I would say are sound to do in any environment, whether it's relationship, home, family, community, you know, uh, suspending judgment, you know, when you're, when you're trying to explain something, you know, not communicating your judgments, but your observations, you know, that's, that's always important to do if you're trying to communicate something to people. I'll jump in. Um... I have a standing desk. You guys all noticed me sit down. I was in great pain for the second half of this. <laughs> I had to sit down, sorry about that. <laughs> but yeah, the, 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 the cognitive aspects of the um, conversation were really good. Um, and uh, not only did I feel reassured, but I also learned a few uh, a few new ways of thinking about it and ways of talking about it. Um, I have in particular this, uh, this idea of um, not letting what you're hearing cause your own emotion because it will distract you from hearing what else is to be said. And I use this image of a bunch of statues that have the lightning rod coming up behind their head. They're on top of a building. I think they're somewhere in the UK. And, um, and I say, you know, you need the lightning rod. So when you start feeling an emotion, it to, you can ground it out and not let it take your head off. 
So, so that was, that was really cool to see some different words around that. Yeah, Lou, there's a, a, a common root. Um, I think, uh, I think what I learned is that empathy and compassion are the same thing. So, um, maybe, and, uh, maybe that's how I can face the people who are trying to do harm, uh, with regard to the word empathy. Uh, um, I would like to suggest that they are different though. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd be happy to explore continuing that conversation. Um, in any event, one of the things I, I would, uh, will say, and I'd like to continue on in, in the, this notion of coding empathy. I mm -hmm. think there's a really interesting mm -hmm. space in there and that's specific to the coder brain, mm -hmm. the logical brain that, that that is in sort of endemic to a coder programmer mindset and and the notion of empathy within that is is fascinating to me um i really really enjoyed this notion uh, this third notion i want to say of the desires and values and and tying that in it's something that i haven't really layered in i've, I've sort of been focused on that sort of box of empathy as a box of of just observing and not acting but tying that in to your value system is is really uh, powerful and um yeah it's always enjoyable to observe other people listening to other people and saying hmm I, wow i'm lost as well or i you know that that you can you're practicing listening while watching other people listening to somebody speak. And, and that's also an opportunity. And, and I've been doing these, this talk I did last week and I got another one no, two weeks ago and I got another one coming up on Tuesday where I'm going to practice a public mini em empathy circle where the space that you are talking about, Edwin, and the number of eyeballs watching you listen to somebody speak and, and reflect causes apoplectic, you know, existential issues that are so typical of our daily lives with bings and bangs and beeps and notifications that are distracting us. And, and, I'm, and I want to alert. And by the way, the club I'm dealing with, it's called the Real Time Club. It's the oldest tech group in, in the United Kingdom and maybe in the world. It began in 1969. And, uh, it, and so it's a bunch of coders and programmers anyway. That's what I'm doing on Tuesday. Yes. Can I say something quick? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I definitely want to contact, uh, maybe continue this conversation, Minter. Um, there is a woman named Andrea Goulet who is also working on empathy with coders. Um, she's even saying things like writing yourself comments is empathy with your future self mm. um and things like that so yeah so she's i presume she's turkish but um the the man i was speaking with talked about uh, how to write code that is empathic with the coder who's going to then take it on right yeah and especially in the 24 7 uh, mode anyway beautiful yeah well great uh yeah f for me it's like it seems like we're just getting started there's this whole you know, empathy, compassion, more to talk about all these other topics <laughs> uh, going deeper. So, yeah, I'm going to be doing these every week or so. Um, you know, you're, everyone's welcome to take part in, in more of these uh, dialogues and we bring in different authors. And uh, so, yeah, I, I get a lot out of, uh, out of these, these uh, discussions. So thank you very much for taking part and um, we'll see you at the next Empathy Circle. Thanks, Bye, everyone. guys. It's great to see you, Lou.